Okay, thank you for tuning in to this talk on process physics, which is a new way of doing foundational physics developed by Australian physics professor Reg Cahill. It is based on a monadology approach and as such is very much in line with Lee Smolin's 2019 book Einstein's Unfinished Revolution. Process physics can be considered a truly ecological, organismic, relational and habit-establishing way of doing physics. All this in stark contrast with our contemporary mainstream physics, which is basically none of all this. In fact, our current physics is especially non-ecological, since it likes to split up its universe of discourse into target system, subject system and their external environment. Because of this tendency to dissect nature into smaller bits and pieces, mainstream physics can be characterized as doing physics in a box, as Lee Smolin likes to call it. It separates natural systems from the rest of the universe, including observers. In contrast, process physics may be called doing physics without a box, in that it models nature as an ecological whole without any a priori separation between subject and target side, and without excluding any environmental influences. When proposing laws of nature and their initial conditions, the problem is that although these laws ultimately aim to offer a scientific account of the universe and its origin, their own origin remains a total mystery. Process physics avoids this problem by starting from a background of initially undifferentiated randomness that will gradually develop its own habit-establishing foreground patterning. So this is a process of evolving onward from what came before, hence the expression routine of nature. Furthermore, mainstream physics deals with information for us that is, observables in the form of empirical data. Whereas process physics is all about information for the process itself. Process physics doesn't give a reproduction formula for empirical data, like our conventional physics does, but it basically simulates the processuality of nature by modeling its beables. That is, by modeling nature's events and their relational crosstalk, so to say, and all of that by means of a relational monadology. Next in line is that mainstream physics typically tries to reduce all of nature to inert bits of matter in motion, whereas process physics treats nature as an integrated web of organismic relations. Finally, because of its belief in reductionism, mainstream physics treats conscious experience as an epiphenomenon, or even as entirely illusory. In process physics, however, subjectivity is a primordial, inherent aspect of nature. That is, the emergent activity patterns in the process monadology seem to come with a collectively grown preference of how to connect among each other. So this can be thought of as proto-subjective and biomimetic because it seems to exhibit the same selectional connectivity as, for instance, in neural networks and slime mold foraging patterns. So mainstream physics separates the subject side from the target side of observation something which Aaron Schrödinger expressed like this. Without being aware of it, and without being rigorously systematic about it, we exclude the subject of cognizance from the domain of nature that we endeavor to understand. We step with our own person back into the part of an onlooker who does not belong to the world, a world which by this very procedure becomes an objective world. Now, this method has worked very well for small subsystems of nature, like Galileo's favorite object of study, brass balls, 
but it breaks down when trying to extrapolate it to nature as a whole, because we cannot place ourselves and our measurement equipment outside of the universe. Instead of being outside our target of observation, we are in fact inside the world to be observed. We're actually seamlessly embedded parts of it, active participants in a world just as active as we ourselves, co-workers in the process of nature. In stark contrast, our familiar method of external observation basically treats the world as a collection of external objects. This, however, does not reflect how nature hangs together as one integrated process, and therefore it comes with a fair amount of problems. The first problem already appears quite soon in the measurement stage. Mainstream physics starts out by singling out some process of interest P, separate from the measuring instrument and the observer. But ultimately, it's impossible to determine where the actual separation between the target and subject side is to be drawn. It can be drawn between process and measuring instrument, between instrument and observer, between the eyes and the brain, between the brain and the perception of process P, or even between the perception of process P and its physical equation, which is arguably located in the abstract world of mathematical ideas. Now, despite the serious ambiguity of the target-subject split, it still stood the test of time, and from Galileo onward, has given us many empirically adequate physical equations. It works so well, in fact, that it is often forgotten that our measurement data and sensory data are actually not fully complete carbon copies of the target of observation itself. But because of the success of expressing our observations in terms of numerical data, we started to think of observation in an info-computational manner, as the mere registration of mathematically tractable computational information. Accordingly, when we look at this linear measurement sequence from the left-hand side, it can be likened with classical information theory, going from information source to recipient. And when we look at the right-hand side of the sequence, from measurement instrument to physical equation, we can recognize the format of um, algorithmic information theory, which is all about compressing empirical data into suitable algorithms. A hidden side effect of this linear info-computational methodology is that our numerical data, mathematical equations, concepts, categories, symbols and names are typically synonymized with their target process P, or with whatever it is that we decided to call P. But this synonymy between the two sides of the target-subject split can only be imagined to exist after the split has been drawn. On top of that, the empirical agreement between measurement data and physical equation must always be forced by us on the basis of subjective decision-making within the measurement practice. That is, we subjectively choose which data points deviate too much and should be left out, which observable quantities should be included in our physical equations, which statistical formats should be employed, etc., etc. So despite what this linear setup might imply, our physical equations are not exact objective representations of some target process P. Werner Heisenberg already mentioned this long ago when he said that what we observe is not nature in itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning, always with an element of subjectivity. This effectively means that our targets of observation do not objectively exist separately and independently from our means of observation. This doesn't, of course, make all electrons and other elementary particles illusory or pure fabrications of the mind. But it does mean that our concept of an electron is better thought of as a context-dependent figure of speech, 
or a fab, for all practical purposes, as John Stuart Bell used to put it. So at the end of the day, it is a figure of speech for how the processuality of nature plays out through the lens of empirical experience. So the linear sequence of infocomputational representation is actually quite misleading. After all, no external representation will ever be able to give an exact one-on-one -on -one synonymy with the target side. Therefore, it would be better to look for a method that does not portray the target side from the subject side of the split. Semiotics, which by the way includes biosemiotics, seems to be much better equipped to give a view from within. That is, it enables us to look at the empirical experience not as a linear sequence, but as a cyclic process, well embedded within the greater process of nature itself. Hence, we do not get to know nature by taking in empirical and sensory data from the outside of it, but instead we make sense of nature from the inside, by living through it. Therefore, the process of going through a semiotic cycle is a far better way to depict scientific observation. In the preparation part, the target process is singled out or soaked loose from its embedding environment, after which it can be submitted to observation further on down the line, where it will have its impact on the sign interpreting observer. Furthermore, the formalization part of the semiotic cycle deals with the ever more precise formulation of physical equations. Going into more detail, the formalization process runs approximately like this. There is a table of raw measurement outcomes that is typically identified with system states 1, 2, 3 and so on, thus basically making them synonymous with the natural system that we are trying to capture mathematically. It is supposed that the system evolves from one state to the next. We can then try to model this with an algorithm. Accordingly, possibly relevant member parameters have to be chosen. The raw data have to be encoded into a carefully selected algorithm that fits these data. After which, this algorithm must be decoded again to check for empirical agreement with any future data. When we put the subs subsequent system states on top of each other, we get a sequence of system states or data entries accompanied by the outcomes uh, produced by the algorithm. This sequence can then be interpreted as a time series. And whenever a mathematical relation is found that agrees well enough with the past, present and future empirical data, we can safely speak of a well-matured physical equation, like for instance Newton's second law or Galileo's equation here. All in all, a lot of subjective choices involved regarding which parameters to include into the algorithm, choosing acceptable margins of error, choosing which criteria should be the leading ones when it comes to algorithm choice, algorithm selection, and uh, which statistical format to use, etc. etc. However, once a physical equation has reached full maturity and social ac acceptance, the entire semiotic cycle, and especially the role of subjective choice, is banished to the background. So what is left is basically the idea that nature can be equated or synonymized with the data and algorithms that come from empirical observation. And both the semiotic cycle and any post-algorithmic interpretation are typically pushed to the background in favor of no interpretation at all. Or in other words, the so-called shut up and calculate approach, also known as instrumentalism. Like this, mainstream physics simply becomes the act of turning all of nature into mere mathematics, and it basically reasons away all acts of interpretation that ultimately make this mathematization possible at all. Likewise, 
It also renders irrelevant the feedback loop that runs from post-algorithmic interpretation to inspire the context of use with new possibilities. All in all, this denial of pre- and post-algorithmic interpretation allows mainstream physics to declare itself as fundamental by portraying nature as the real-world equivalent of its mathematics. But in reality, it is always preceded by pre-algorithmic interpretation and subjective choice. From this alternative perspective, this pre-algorithmic interpretation, or metaphysics, which is par partly based on intuition and creative decision-making, should then automatically be considered more fundamental than the physical equations that it helps put together. In other words, although mainstream physics typically supposes that our physical equations should, should ultimately be able to spell out nature in its full entirety, it overlooks the fact that its mathematical formulations can never be fundamental, because there is always pre-algorithmic interpretation that necessarily precedes it. This, then, tells us that the mathematical map should not be confused with the territory to be mapped, just as observables cannot ever reach the status of beables. So what does process physics offer as an alternative to avoid all these problems? In order to illustrate this, we can look at a possible scenario for biological evolution, the coming into actuality of life from a prebiotic soup. Such a primordial soup can initially be a rather low-grade background with nothing much happening. But according to Stuart Kaufman and others, an autocatalytic network can spontaneously spring into being under the right circumstances. For instance, when there is enough chemical diversity within the soupy fluid, Kaufman holds that a collectively autocatalytic network can spring up from the lower grade background, after which further complexification can occur. Now, in the process physics model, something similar happens. From an initially undifferentiated ground level of irregular noisy activity patterns, a network of higher order activity can lift itself into actuality through collective low-grade background processuality. Now mainstream physics claims, more or less, that our natural universe is called into being by laws of nature that are just given with no deeper origins of their own. Process physics, on the other hand, suggests that nature has come into actuality from a largely undifferentiated background, from a void-like pre-space that initially has no explicit connectivity or pattern formation to it. This can be interpreted as a primordial vacuum-like state, like in this picture. Closer up, however, this vacuum-like state may be seen as a fiercely fluctuating ocean of potential, which contains all of existence in latent form. This is actually very similar to what is believed in quantum field theory. So we now know that process physics does not start out with pre-existing laws of nature, but with routine of nature. It does so by setting up a monadology matrix in which an initially patternless network of relations gradually starts to exhibit more higher order pattern formation. Here we can see that this routine is written as an iterative update routine that indexes connection strength in the relational matrix that makes up the monadology. So this relational matrix forms an indexical grid of emergent connectivity. With each iteration, the update routine not only gives rise to a kind of system-wide cross-connectivity, but it can also be thought of as letting its connectivity strength all over the system fluctuate ever so slightly in a noisy manner. This reflects the partial uncertainty about what is going on elsewhere within the system. 
So like this, the relational matrix starts evolving from an initially patternless pre-geometric vacuum-like stage. And as the matrix runs through its update cycles again and again, each time it basically adds a layer of noise over all individual connection strengths within the matrix. The preceding connection strengths of all member nodes in the relation matrix are represented by BIJ old, which is the precedence term, looking like this from up close. The following two terms are the binding term or cross-linkage term, which can be thought of as a realization of max principle, and the novelty infusing noise term. These two terms mostly cancel each other out, but in the long run, there will be enough reactive low-grade activity patterns to enable the emergence of a complexly outward branching network of higher order process structures, as is illustrated on the extreme left-hand side. Well, at least, the humble beginnings of it. As the system goes through its iterations, the precedence term, the cross-linkage term and the noise term together will give rise to a constantly fluctuating landscape of connection strengths. Some entries become large because of the effect of the iterative update routine. These large connection strengths tend to hook up together to form islands of elevated connectivity, like this. And when considering only the islands with large valued connections, we can submit them to statistical analysis and see what global pattern there is to their behavior. This statistical analysis basically amounts to counting the total number of member nodes in those islands, then pick one reference node and see how many neighbors are nearest neighbors, how many second nearest neighbors, how many are three connections away, and so on. Now, the distance to strength ratio for connectivity nodes tells us that the overwhelming majority is formed by weak, short distance connections, and only a minute fraction is made up by strong, long distance connections. In the islands of elevated connectivity, this translates into short distance, local connections being the most probable ones, which then automatically leads to tree graph-like branching structures as displayed above the table. Since this will be the most probable configuration that will occur, the connectivity nodes within these branching structures will most likely organize themselves into a near three-dimensional distribution relative to one another. That is, the branching structures will end up getting the same dis distance distribution among their nodes as uniformly arranged points in a three-dimensional space. This can be found because the number of neighbors for our chosen reference node turns out to increase in proportion to the square of the number of steps away. And this phenomenon is elsewhere only seen in three-dimensional spaces. So what we get here is emergent three-dimensionality from initial non-connectivity, driven by iterative stochastic routine. The different branching structures basically grow to become embeddable in 3D as cell-like subnetworks looking somewhat like this, although this artistic impression should be a bit more realistically looking. What is also quite remarkable, and should not be forgotten, is that growth and decay of network connections occurs as the continuous addition of noisiness strengthens and weakens earlier grown islands of connectivity and their branching structures. As this goes on for long enough, each locality within the network will become so much correlated with the rest of the system that it acquires a local sense of how to contribute to global system-preserving criticality. This then saves the system from falling into chaos or, at the other extreme end, getting stuck in static order. Like this, we may say that there is a local sense of global systemic self-preservation which can be seen as a very rudimentary sense of subjective decision-making 
through selectional connectivity. As such, the network as a whole can be seen to have directionality. That is, it exhibits a tendency to, to develop towards increasing complexity. Process ecologist Robert Ulanovich likes to call this ascendancy, a feature which is also characteristic of autocatalytic networks and ecosystems. Although this is a short time lapse of the surface of the Sun, it illustrates quite well how the cell like branching structures may act together as an integrated dynamic network with individual cells coming in and out of actuality. Mind you, this is just an analogy to help visualize things. Next to this complexity seeking behavior, the network exhibits emergent relativistic inertial and gravitational effects, emergent near-classical behavior, creative novelty, inherent time-like processuality with open-ended evolution, and many other features that we can also find in nature itself. So to recap, the process physics model evolves firstly from an initially panelist pre-space, where there is no manifest patterning, towards a three-dimensional early universe with a relatively uniform distribution of matter. In the long enough run, then, this will eventually take on the shape of a complex neural network-like cosmic web. When starting with the cosmic microwave background, beyond which we cannot make any observations, it evolves like this, running from initial near uniformity to the current situation of a neural network shaped cosmic web. In animated motion, the neural network like organization of the universe at a supergalactic scale looks as follows. This is a short piece taken from the Millennium Simulation, which is a large-scale supercomputer simulation of the universe. From all this we can draw several conclusions, namely process physics is an utterly ecological way of doing physics in that it does not split up its universe of discourse into target system, subject system and their external environment. Furthermore, process physics is organismic rather than mechanistic, mutually informative rather than based on mere numerical data. It aims to set up a more beable-like modeling of nature instead of portraying its observables. Also, uh, via what may be called routine of nature, it is habit establishing instead of being governed by pre-available laws of nature. And on top of all that, it is also noise driven so that creative novelty becomes possible as an alternative for strict determinism. All this, however, does not mean that we should get rid of our conventional nature dissecting physics as soon as possible. Instead, I'd like to make the case that we need a binocular physics, in which our conventional way of doing physics in a box and process physics become each other's frame of reference. Mainstream physics, when it tries to mathematize our designated natural systems, should be checked against what process physics has to say. Just as process physics, as modeling of nature as a whole, should check its results against our conventional physics. Finally then, process physics is based on what may be called foundations without foundation. That is, the process physics monadology models nature as if it were an emergent autocatalytic network, 
that is lifted into actuality by the collective, mutually upward-nudging fluctuations of low-level stochastic background activity. So instead of being limited to modeling nature at the level of observables, as our contemporary physics does, process physics is basically a large step closer to a beable-like modeling of nature. And this may very well free us from a lot of persistent troubles in the foundations of physics. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, just drop me an email using the address below. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.